the grace of Jesus, something wonderful. We meet this morning as a family in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We meet as brothers and sisters in Christ, accepting the responsibility this places upon us to love one another as He has loved us. We meet as God's lights in a dark world. And we pray that through our words and our lives, others will be drawn into God's family and accept Him as their Savior and Lord. Would you join me in singing number 256, It Is Well With My Soul. Thank you for the privilege of gathering together to worship this day. May our worship 
be honoring to you. May our every word and thought and action be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Master, our eternal Father, forevermore. It is good to be together, worshiping the Lord, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying even more His presence, celebrating His goodness and faithfulness. Glad that some at home are joining with us as we worship together. We're singing number 512. I shall see Him face to face and tell the story. Saved by grace. If you feel like standing, feel free. As we sing, Saved by Grace. Moses, 
who believed firmly in the afterlife and who helped the Jews in exile preserve their identity as God's chosen people. Josephus tells us that the Pharisees lived a simple lifestyle, were harmonious in their dealings with others, they were caring, they respected their elders, they sought to convert Gentiles to the Jewish faith. Those are all good things, right? The Pharisees' goal was to teach the Jews how to continue to practice their faith, even though in Babylon they had no temple, no priests, could not make animal sacrifices. So the Pharisees tried to teach people how to practice their faith at home, on weekdays, outside of church. They would gather people together in small group Bible studies in people's homes. They called it synagogue. And that in those groups, they would teach people how to apply the Old Testament scriptures to their daily lives. Things like tithing and keeping the Sabbath and ritual purity. Without having opportunity to make animal sacrifices, to gain salvation, the Pharisees encouraged the people to obey God always, as best they knew how, as their means of attaining salvation. Live according to the scriptures. The Jewish religion we know today, with a rabbi in a synagogue in every city, that's the legacy of the Pharisees. They're also responsible for the Masoretic text of the Bible, from which the King James Version is translated. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives of Jesus' time, trying to preserve the traditions, the values, the religion of God's Old Testament people. And I applaud them for that. But over time, out, the outward practice of religion became more important than worshiping the Lord with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. But let there be no doubt, the Pharisees were good people. Holy men trying the best they knew how to serve their God, to please their God, to honor their God. Everyday Jews looked up to the Pharisees. They admired the Pharisees. They listened to the Pharisees. Little Jewish boys wanted to be Pharisees when they grew up. Pharisees, however, had no authority, no power in Jerusalem like the Sadducees did. The only way for the Pharisees to really make a difference was to try to influence the masses, the grassroots. And then along came Jesus, introducing a a new kind of religion that focused on people instead of focusing on rules and rituals and traditions. Jesus tried to make it all about love. And the multitude started listening to Jesus instead of listening to the Pharisees. Now remember, the job of the Pharisees is to protect the old time religion. This became much harder for the Pharisees after Jesus came on the scene. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee, like his father before him. Saul describes himself in Philippians 3 as being circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, according to the law, a Pharisee. In other words, a stickler for the letter of the law. Concerning zeal for God, persecuting the church. That was his badge of honor. As to the righteousness before the law, he was blameless. But Paul goes on to say in verse 8, But I now count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. All else pales in comparison to knowing Christ. 
Saul sought to protect the old time religion by persecuting the followers of the way. The apostles and the early Christians were, were trying to change the rules and traditions of the Jews. The Pharisees did not like change. The Pharisees saw the followers of Jesus as being liberals, progressives, social activists. Saul thought he was pleasing God. He thought he was doing God a favor by arresting and getting rid of those who were introducing new ways of being God's people. New ways of worshiping God. Nicodemus too was a Pharisee. Some Pharisees like Nicodemus were truly seekers after truth. Not simply defenders of what they already believed. Some of them were open to new ideas about Jehovah. We read in John 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, unless God be with him. Understand that the Pharisees are not bad people, like most Christians seem to think. In fact, some Pharisees looked for Jesus and warned him that his life was in danger. In Luke 13, it says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto Jesus, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. These are not bad people, just very religious people. Some Pharisees even invited Jesus to their homes for lunch. In Luke 7, it, it's Simon the Pharisee who hosted Jesus for dinner. And one of the Pharisees desired Jesus that he would eat with him. And Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And you know the rest of that story. Not all Pharisees hated Jesus. They might not have understood him or his teachings, but they were open to him and his ministry. Another Pharisee invited Jesus to his home in Luke 11, and still another in Luke 14. Not all Pharisees were opposed to Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 23, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not according to their works, for they say and do not. Did Jesus not agree with the teachings of the Pharisees? Just the opposite. He told us to do everything the Pharisees tell us to do. Because their teaching is from the Old Testament book of Moses. And that's good. But the Pharisees apparently haven't figured out how to live according to their own teachings. They haven't found the power to put into practice what they preach. Often when Pharisees did the right things, they did it for the wrong reasons. Jesus continues in verse 5. All their works the Pharisees do to be seen by men. And they love the uppermost places of fe at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called by men rabbi. The Pharisees did love. They loved being thought highly of. They loved being honored guests at banquets. They loved getting special seating at church. They loved being greeted by strangers on the street as if they were celebrities. They loved their religion. But they didn't love God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. And they didn't always love their neighbors like they loved themselves. See, pride seeped in, taking the place of love. They fought they were doing great. In Luke 18, 
Jesus tells the story. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican here. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Watch out. Pride comes before a fall. In Matthew 23, Jesus uses some pretty tough language when speaking to the Pharisees as a whole. He calls them hypocrites, children of hell. He calls them blind, whitewashed tombs, brood of vipers, which are poisonous snakes. He even accuses the Pharisees of leading God's people astray. Why is God being so harsh with these good men who are trying really hard to please their God? I think he's being tough on them because they are good men, doing a lot of good works. I think he's being hard on them because they are so close to the kingdom of God, and yet so far. Because so many people look up to them and follow their example. Because in trying to protect the old-time religion, the Pharisees were making a few serious mistakes. They were missing the mark on a few things. Number one, they were avoiding sinners, like tax collectors and prostitutes and thieves. They were afraid that other people's sins might rub off on them and contaminate them. Their own purity was more important to them than reaching out in love to those who were trapped in sin. They often criticized Jesus for dining with sinners or visiting with Samaritans or allowing women to touch him. You see, the Pharisees didn't believe in grace. They thought you had to earn your standing as God's children by keeping the law. They, they thought that God couldn't love sinners, so they shouldn't love them either. They had no compassion, no mercy for those stuck in sin. They didn't think there was any salvation for people like that. At the same time, Jesus was teaching in Matthew chapter 5, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, what good is a light if you hide it under a bushel basket? What good is a light that only shines in the daytime? What good is a flashlight that only works in broad daylight? Candles and lamps were created for dark places. Jesus calls us to share his truth, his love, his hope with those who are trapped in the dark. The Pharisees, on the other hand, considered their own purity much more important than seeking the lost. Because they didn't love as Jesus was. Mistake number one is still a common error among some believers today. Isolationists who won't fellowship with unbelievers. Who won't even fellowship with believers who believe differently than they do. Mistake number two. The Pharisees were more concerned about rules and institutions and programs than they were about people. Remember, they saw their role as protecting, defending the old-time religion, which is a good thing, right? But sometimes in defending the Jewish faith, <coughs> people's needs got ignored. For example, the Pharisees were big defenders of the Sabbath rest. Which is an important teaching of scripture. But there are many different ideas of what constitutes 
of Sabbath rest. The Pharisees had some ideas. In fact, they had at least a hundred ideas of what it meant to rest on the Sabbath. And they thought their ideas were the only ones that counted. People like Jesus, who didn't always obey the Pharisees' rules about the Sabbath, were considered sinners. The Pharisees would make no exceptions to the rules. Their rules were hard and fast. No extenuating circumstances would be considered. To a Pharisee, for example, Sabbath rest meant no doctoring. It doesn't matter how much you're suffering. It doesn't matter if you're dying. That's not a good enough excuse to break the Sabbath rule by going to see your doctor on the Sabbath. For example, Mark chapter 3. And Jesus entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there who had a withered hand. And the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And Jesus said unto the man who had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto the Pharisees, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But the Pharisees held their peace. And when Jesus had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, in other words, they lacked compassion and love, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against Jesus, how they might destroy him. It's not that the Pharisees didn't care about people. They just loved their religion and their rules more than people. They had to protect the Jewish religion above all else. Similar scenes to this one occurred over and over and over again as Jesus helped, sought to help people who came to church on Sabbath. But the rules of the Pharisees kept getting in the way. May our personal rules and convictions and political views never stop us from helping someone in their time of need or from showing the love of Christ. The Pharisees declared that their religion was more important than people. Jesus argued with that. He said, God loves people more than anything. Nothing to God is more important than people. Any people, all people, even strangers, or people we don't see eye to eye with. Jesus did not come to earth to save religion, or to save the temple, or to enforce the Ten Commandments, or to protect the Sabbath, or the priesthood. He came to save people lost sinners. Another mistake. The Pharisees focused more on the natural rather than the spiritual. Jesus made it clear that his kingdom was not of this earth. And yet the Pharisees worried about buildings, money, and health, and laws, and sacrifices. Ignoring the inner man, the heart, the soul. For them, as long as appearances were godly, you've done good. You know, the Pharisees could talk like Christians, look like Christians, but they didn't love like Christ loved. Mark 7, Jesus said, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold to the tradition of men. 
Paul tells us to put no confidence in the flesh, because God looketh on the heart. It's easy to talk like Christians, to go to church, to be kind in public, to avoid the very appearance of evil, but have no peace, no joy, no abundant life, because the Lord doesn't dwell in your heart, because you haven't been born again, because you haven't surrendered to His Spirit. Mistake number four, and as you can see, these are all interconnected. The Pharisees focused on outward conformity, the external, neglecting the heart. Their teachings were all about what you wear, what you eat, what you watch, who you associate with. They were upset with Jesus because his disciples did not wash their hands the right way before meals and before worship. They didn't do it Pharisee style. John the Baptist insisted his disciples follow their, the rules. Why not Jesus? The Pharisees made sure that Food was prepared kosher, and the dishes were washed properly. They tithed to the extreme. If they grew herbs in their garden, one-tenth of all the basil or chives would be given to the priests as tithes. But their hearts were sometimes hard, not loving, unable to forgive. Or be gracious. They thought that if they could follow their hundreds of man made rules, that they'd be considered a good person and God would bless them, regardless of their heart's condition. Regardless of whether you love God or not, whether you love people or not, if you do good, God will have to bless you. But God hasn't called us to greatness, or to fame, or to power, or to wealth. He's called us to serve, to be loving, caring servants, to be humble and meek. Many of us forget this. We get busy trying to protect what we feel is ours. Protecting our rights, protecting our freedoms, protecting our status, protecting our tax exemptions, protecting our pensions. And God has not called us to do any of those things. He simply asks us to serve Him and trust Him. That He will provide all that we need. It was hard for the Pharisees to change their ways. It was hard for them to admit that they were wrong. Does that surprise you? It's hard for us too. In 1997, there was a cult named Heaven's Gate that announced publicly that the comet coming towards Earth was being followed by a spaceship which was coming to rescue them the true believers from this planet that was doomed to construct de destruction. The members all went out and bought expensive telescopes so they could watch the rescue ships coming for them. After the comet had passed Earth, the members took their telescopes back to the store for a refund because obviously they were broken. They didn't work. Because they couldn't find, the telescopes couldn't find the spaceships that were definitely there. It's hard to admit when we're wrong. The Pharisees couldn't admit that they got it wrong either. Sometimes we have that problem too. One of the things I appreciated about my mother. She was raised with a lot of very strong convictions. But she was willing to reevaluate her beliefs when given good reason. When I was young, she would not allow us to 
eat or drink on church property. No one was to wear a wedding ring. We were not allowed to do anything that was fun on the Sunday. And of course, no movies, no dancing. But after Mom and Dad retired, I learned that they were going to Swiss Chalet after church every, almost every Sunday. And I was baffled. That was a total no-no to eat in a restaurant on Sundays. So finally I got up the nerve and I said, Mom, what's going on? And she said, son, it's your fault. <laughs> Something you said once made me rethink some of the things I was taught as a child. I have no idea what I've said. I know it's hard to change. It takes a lot of humility. But it does our souls good to admit once in a while that we were wrong or that we don't know the answer. The Pharisees struggled to do that. The Pharisees believed that if they prayed hard enough, God would have to answer their prayer. They believed that if they fasted long enough, God would have to bless them. They believed that if they went to church to worship often enough, God would have to save them. If they gave enough money to the church before December 31st, that God would have to reward them. That if they volunteered, volunteered enough at the soup kitchen, God would have no choice but to accept them in his family. Jesus told them they got it wrong. That salvation is by grace. It is a gift from God. Rather than receiving from God because of what we do, or because of what we don't do because of the rules, We receive God's blessing because Jesus died in our place. We receive salvation because Jesus took our punishment for us. We get, Jesus got what we deserved. Now we get what Jesus deserves. Total acceptance by the Heavenly Father. Unconditional love of the Heavenly Father. Absolute forgiveness of the Heavenly Father. By grace alone. Not by works of right doing. In John 8, the Pharisees caught a woman committing adultery. She had broken a rule. One of the big ten, by the way. They had no compassion for her. They showed no mercy, no love. The Pharisees would never think of forgiving this woman. And they expected Jesus to do the same. The Pharisees were ready to stone her on the spot because that's what she deserved. But Jesus loved her. He forgave her. He showed her grace. He gave her another chance. So the Pharisees walked away in turmoil. Jesus left the market square in peace. And the woman went home, a new person, because of grace. Let us learn from the mistakes of the Pharisees. They missed two things in God's great plan. Love and grace. We don't we don't earn God's blessings by being good enough. God shows us his goodness because he is gracious. Let's not love our religion 
or our rules or our institutions. Let's love God and others more than we love things. Because our God loves people more than anything. How can we be more righteous than the Pharisees? We will never be more righteous. Except as Jesus Christ lives his righteousness in us. We will never become more righteous than the Pharisees by being more religious. The only way to become more righteous than the Pharisees is to accept Christ's righteousness as a gift of God's grace. So what are our lessons learned from the Pharisees? God is not impressed with our sacrifices. The things we don't do because of our rules or convictions. God is not impressed by our giving to charity our tithing, our almsgiving, our time spent doing religious activities. But he delights in our love for one another and in our love for God and our love for those who don't like us. If you want to put a smile on our Father's face, Show loving care to someone you don't have to love. Lesson number two. We don't receive answers to our prayers because of all the good deeds we do. Salvation is by grace alone. Answers to prayer are also by grace alone. Being more religious isn't going to make God love us anymore. It's not going to get our prayers answered any faster. It's not going to release more of God's blessings upon us. God already loves us to the extreme. Yes, God is an extremist. He blesses us and answers our prayers only because He loves us. Not because we deserve it. The Pharisees thought they could win God's favor by living better than their neighbors. But the scriptures tell us that all good gifts come from above, from our Heavenly Father. And that they are just that. They are gifts. Just because he loves us so. Grace. The unmerited favor of a loving God. We don't have to stage a massive protest to get our Father's attention. He is watching over us. Each and every one. He knows our needs. He knows the desires of our hearts. And he longs to bless each and every one of his children. Would you pray with me? Father, we humble ourselves before you. Knowing that we deserve none of your goodness. But your word convinces us. That you are full of compassion and grace. And you delight in blessing your children. So Lord, here's our cup. We hold them up to let you fill. Fill our lives 
with whatever you know we need. We long to receive from you enough grace for each day, strength for each challenge, faith for each trial. Lord, our lives are in your hands. Do with us what you will. Honor us or humble us. We trust you and your plan for our lives, for our church, for our world. May thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in singing in number 209? Grace greater than our sin. Mm -hmm.